So welcome everybody. Uh, this is uh, the third in our countdown to COP series of monthly events, trying to identify actions and activities that we can do collectively and individually to get to zero carbon. And uh, this zero carbon food event is being organized by Transition Chestfield and Chestfield Climate Alliance. And um, Transition Chestfield, you know, being around uh, many years, we've, we've got a lot of uh, interest in food and grain projects. So as well as the Inspire Community Garden, we have an annual potato day, we run a free seed swap, we have a, an abundance project collecting waste, fruit and vegetables, and uh, we've also done uh, vegetarian and vegan cookery workshops. And food is one of those areas where, you know, I think more than many other areas, it's one area where we can all do something individually as well as uh, collectively and can make a difference. But, um, you know, not everybody has, has the choice or, or, or the means sometimes. Um, and although this is this is predominantly about carbon and how we get to zero carbon, uh, we need to think about the food system in, in, in a you know in a much more holistic way as well um, that takes all the environmental impacts into into account, particularly biodiversity. But you know the the, the food you know has so many so many elements to it. Uh, you know cultural um, uh, you know the issues of waste, animal welfare, inequality, etc. You know food poverty. So so I think there's a lot of things that can come together, you know, by growing food more sustainably and in a way that, that, that's compatible with zero carbon. So we've got um, four brilliant speakers today. Um, thank you very much for all of those for joining today. Um, so we're going to start with um, Gareth. Oh, and I should also say, if you've got any questions, great if you can write those in the chat, just put a cue and then your question. And we'll, we'll, we'll save all the questions till the end. And I'll ask people to, to voice their questions uh, for the purpose of the recording, even if they've been answered in the chat. So we're gonna start with Gareth Roberts today. Um, so Gareth, if you wanna, I'll, I'll introduce you while you're getting your, your, your presentation up. Um, so I heard Gareth speak uh, at a Sheffield event uh, a few months ago, which is really interesting. Um, he's a founder member and co-director of Regather, which is a, an organic cooperative which supplies organic fruit and veg boxes uh, in this area in Sheffield. He's also a coordinator of Chef Food, Sheffield's food partnership, which I'm very interested in how we can get one of those in Chesterfield uh, or in Derbyshire. And his mission is a food system with money retained in the local economy, more productive land, better quality food, improved health and better awareness and involvement with changing the food system for the better. So over to you, Gareth. Thank you, Lisa. Um, good morning. Um, I'm in that strange situation again on a Saturday morning where I'm talking to a large group of people, none of whom I can see and I can't even see myself. So uh, uh, it's, it's become familiar, but um, thanks very much for taking time to come to uh, the event and, and thanks very much for the invitation. Um, so uh, yeah, I'm, I'm very pleased just to share some of the work that we're doing uh, in, in Sheffield. Um, there's a, a weird sort of geography um, when we talk about towns and cities, um, but of course the food system uh, ignores all of that, um, as does nature uh, and, uh, and, and carbon uh, and generally, you know, the environment. So it's, a, it's always a, uh, an interesting kind of starting point thinking about uh, food systems uh, specific to to a place but um, yeah uh, based in Sheffield uh, I've, I've been doing food system related uh, work uh, both as a volunteer and and as a, an employee uh, in, in a, a variety of ways for, for at least 15 uh, years or so and uh, you know it's an ongoing thing um, but uh, my talk uh, today's uh, system change not climate change how systems thinking is helping transform food for Sheffield and um, yeah I hope uh, this also helps uh, maybe uh, inform and, and direct uh, what what uh, is happening in Chesterfield and uh, yeah let's uh, move on then so a bit about chef food um, to start with so as Lisa mentioned it's the food partnership for Sheffield and um, it, essentially, uh, it's one of a number of food partnerships across the country uh, that, that are 
uh, members of the sustainable food places movement. And that's very much the, the starting point, I think, for any uh, locality, any place that's thinking about uh, uh, developing uh, a food partnership. Uh, but um, it's not to say that you have to uh, link to sustainable food places um, to form a partnership. Uh, I, I am a strong believer and a strong advocate of, of, of the fact that partnerships will already exist. You, you know, uh, transition uh, Chesterfield uh, is a partnership of, of, of individuals, of organisations and so on. I'm sure you'll get what I'm saying there. Um, but, but there is significant benefit by becoming part of a, a national movement, a national network, uh, which, which in this case for food partnerships is, is definitely uh, sustainable food places. Um, so they, they offer a, a, a whole range of support and advocacy campaigns, uh, and in certain cases, uh, grant funding um, to, to help. Uh, but the, the main thing they offer is, is their awards framework. So this allows a place, uh, a town, uh, a city, uh, a county uh, increasingly, which is something new for sustainable food places, but it allows that uh, locality to celebrate and recognize um, all the good work happening around food um, in that in that place and, and it's a bronze silver and gold uh, award which uh, at the moment um, I think they're just on track to award the first gold awards this year uh, but sustainable food places was called sustainable food cities has been going for at least 10 maybe 12 years uh, in some form or another so it just gives you an idea that you know even now with that much um, time uh, and, and fantastic work we're only just seeing the kind of first gold award. So, so yeah, there's a, a lot to a lot to do, um, and obviously being part of a, a movement for me, it's all about solidarity, uh, and 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 it's that solidarity that uh, you know I find um, really helpful and being part of sustainable food places. Um, so in in Sheffield, uh, Chef Food as we've called it, Sheffield's Food Partnership, um, we've got a, a really wide range of partners. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to uh, uh, go into a huge amount of detail as to you know, who they are and what they do uh, for this talk, uh, but um, uh, I think the key point is, is that it's uh, covering all aspects of the food system uh, and, and uh, all levels, so from grassroots uh, uh, organisations um, at the sort of very, very local community level, all the way up to engaging anchor institutions, which obviously for us in Sheffield, um, is our local authority and, and our two universities and, and, and a few others as well. But um, that gives you an idea. Just to mention as well, we're also very much involved with the Sheffield Climate Alliance. And uh, I think, you know, with the Chesterfield Climate Alliance, uh, with yourselves, uh, you, you can you know, understand the, 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 common, the common aims uh, that we all have there. Um, so, yeah, I'm just going to uh, share with you some some uh, ideas, some thoughts, hopefully some insights around food systems, uh, a couple of examples of uh, food systems in action uh, and, and food system challenges. Uh, so just to kind of frame uh, what I'm going to talk about there, hopefully it's going to be of interest. So uh, so starting with food systems. Um, so. I'm a strong believer in food systems education. I think I think it really ought to be something that uh, a lot more time uh, and resource is, is committed to to help all of us um, understand how it is uh, the, the food system that feeds us uh, or hopefully feeds us with a, a healthy, nutritious meal, um, uh, ideally, uh, how that works or, or, or importantly, how it doesn't work. Uh, and, and therefore uh, start the process of, of improving and changing uh, and creating a better, uh, fairer, more healthy, more sustainable food system. And so I, I always find myself when talking with uh, individuals, particularly within um, bigger organisations, uh, you know, it's understandable that how they relate to the food system um, is, is complex uh, and, and fundamentally, um, uh, disconnected. You know, we all face this kind of challenge of being disconnected with, with the food uh, that we eat and that sustains us. And for me, uh, food system education is, is part of addressing that issue. So I, I, this is a simple 
very, very simple uh, graphic to represent uh, different elements of, of a food system. It's a completely um, generalized, simplified uh, model. Um, and obviously, conveniently, as you can see, it's circular. Um, and, um, you know, our food system is by no means uh, circular. Uh, but there are examples where, where maybe we are beginning to achieve that. But, but it gives you an idea of, of what a food system looks like with all its different elements. Uh, and then this is another one. I've just pulled these off of the internet as, as illustrations, really. Uh, uh, but I like using them in, in, in talks uh, such as this, because this one particularly uh, takes those elements and starts to build into uh, each of them some prerequisites um, or, or some, you know, some outcomes, if you like. Uh, so, so we've got a, a similar uh, structure, uh, but we've also start to see some of the, the additional elements. So a slight sort of complication, uh, a complexity of that system's view. Uh, and then we jump straight in uh, uh, to the most sophisticated uh, graphic model that, um, that I've found. Uh, this did start life as uh, something that I've again found on the internet through doing research, but I actually uh, we got a graphic designer and a group of people together to to, to further develop it. So this is an, a, an adjusted uh, uh, version of, of that model um, with uh, a few kind of key terms that make it a little bit more uh, specific to the uh, UK or, or uh, uh, English context um, because of our governance and, and various other aspects. But I really, really um, find this model very useful so hopefully you, know, you can see i know it's quite detailed but uh, um, the key things to recognize are the the, the fact that we have a multiple different systems that all together um, are integrated uh, into how it is that we, we feed ourselves and um, you know the circularity of some of those systems this is an ideal model you know this is what we uh, you know i think we should be working towards and when we talk about sustainability and fairness uh, and, and health, uh, for example, um, then yeah, we do need to be looking at uh, a really complex uh, uh, but also circular uh, system. And so a quick example, uh, the biological loop there that I hope you can see on the left, um, it, it comes out and it, we have that waste uh, block there. And uh, I, I, forgive me, I don't know exactly the details of the, the waste management um, uh, arrangements in Chesterfield, but I do know in Sheffield, uh, anything you put in a black bin uh, that's collected from uh, your household um, will go into uh, landfill or incineration. The significant proportion being uh, incineration uh, for energy recovery. So what we have there is the uh, calorific value, the embedded energy of that food being turned into heat. Um, and obviously that's significantly uh, better than uh, just lobbing it in a hole in the ground uh, and saying good riddance. Um, it's definitely nowhere near as good uh, as the other options that really ought to be part of uh, how it is we, we manage our waste. Obviously, the best thing to do is avoid that waste in the first place. But uh, just to illustrate this point here, so we have other options, anaerobic digestion, uh, at moving all the way around into that biological system uh, where, you know, it basically comes back around as nutrients. And it's that nutrient content of, of food waste um, that we really ought to be, uh, you know, showing a greater awareness of. And, and here in Sheffield, you know, household collection of food waste uh, for processing would be far better than, than landfill and, and, and also I'd argue far better than, than incineration. But there's lots more examples there. It's a very complex model, but it's, it's about food systems thinking. Um, I'm not going to go into these in any detail, but th there are, I've put together a few links that I think are uh, uh, really useful um, resources. Uh, some of them Sheffield specific with our uh, universities there doing some excellent research. Uh, but uh, I will no doubt be able to share those uh, with you um, following the, 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 the talk today. Um, so what I've got here is, is just to add a, a, a layer of, of maybe understanding. So, you know, what do we talk about when we say food systems thinking or a food systems approach? So obviously there's a, a about food provision. Yeah. So this is the, the various 
sort of stages of uh, field to fork uh, often. Um, and, uh, you, you know, everything about how it is the food is provided uh, for us and what happens to it afterwards. Um, we have those dimensions, social, economic, environmental, biological, political, and increasingly digital, uh, because data plays a huge role in determining how it is our um, food system operates now with, uh, with, with much larger companies like the supermarkets uh, uh, really relying heavily on technology to deliver uh, food to us. Um, concepts, uh, uh, the food shed, uh, really, really interesting. For, I, I like this one particularly. So it, it's a, it's not a big box. Um, you know, it's not a warehouse. It's, it's a, similar to a watershed. So we talk about the productive capacity of a, of a landscape uh, as a food shed. Uh, and so, you know, thinking about, we start to think about bioregions as well. It's another term that's sort of similar to this, but it's about understanding the kind of the parameters, the perimeters, the linkages, particularly from urban to peri-urban to rural. So really starting to get to grips with the geography of our food system. And, and then really another key part of food systems thinking is, is flows. So, you know, food is not a thing. Food is a collection of flows. And, and those flows are, are multiple, they're complex, uh, they're interrelated, uh, but it's actually those different components that make up food uh, that really start to, I think, inform how it is the food system works and what the opportunities are for, for change uh, and making our food systems better. But those flows, as you can see there, are, are very diverse uh, and, and they include power and money uh, and data, uh, quite abstract, um, uh, but, but very embedded uh, and interrelated components. And we've got to get to grips with, with all of them when we talk about food systems thinking and food systems change. Um, so moving forward then, um, I want to just talk briefly about uh, uh, values-based food chains. Okay, so if we have a food system, um, then we have to think about how different parts of that food system work. Uh, that's the food chains. So every meal we eat, every mouthful we eat um, is a, a kind of an instantaneous connection from end to end uh, of, of those of that food system in that food chain. And whether you know whether we think about it or not, whether we're conscious of that or not, whether we have the choice to think about it, uh, and maybe even change it as well is a major issue, but those food chains are there, they do exist. Now, we talk about those as values-based food chains because we want to think about that, that chain, not just as a, uh, a, a thing, but a, but a process uh, and one that has um, not just you know, inputs and outputs, but strategic partners and, and actors that are values-based. So when we talk about uh, a values-based food chain, we would look to customers to make decisions based on uh, values, maybe around fairness, uh, provenance, uh, certain standards, say organic or biodynamic or you know, locality, regionality, uh, fair trade, and, and so on. You know, these are the, the, the various values that might inform. So why do we focus on this? Uh, well, it's based on the understanding that it's actually these chains uh, you know, within the wider food system that are the drivers of change. And we can reconfigure uh, and, and connect and reconnect and disconnect um, all of those different uh, chains and how they work. And with that, we can drive food system change. So it is very much about you know, what we can do uh, as individuals, but then also collectively as communities uh, to change our food system. So a good, uh, we, you know, good case study um, is, is the Regather Box. So this is a values-based food chain um, in action. It's, it's a key part of the Regather enterprise. Uh, we're serving over 800 households um, once a week or once a fortnight uh, with local, seasonal, uh, uh, cooperative and organic produce. Um, now, don't get me wrong. Um, we don't magically grow all of this uh, on, on our allotments, uh, which is a common misunderstanding. Um, we do have land, we are growing some produce, but the supply of that produce 
uh, is significantly less than the demand for that produce in, in our market, even with just you know, 800 households. So we are part of a much bigger supply chain uh, that includes Sheffield producers, but also includes regional wholesalers uh, and the supply chains that supply them. So, you know, yes, we're a local or a localized food uh, uh, system or food chain, um, but we are firmly plugged into a global food system and there is no escaping that. Uh, and um, uh, yes, we could uh, reduce what we buy from elsewhere, uh, but that would then leave our households in a situation where they would have to make alternative arrangements and inevitably uh, you know, convenience, choice, uh, uh, affordability would drive those households back to uh, uh, supermarkets and less sustainable options. So, so for us, it's a trade-off, it's about finding the right balance. Now that's not without its challenges. Um, so here's a, a graphic uh, which starts to plug in the kind of food systems thinking that I've shared with you. Um, the uh, values-based food chains um, that we're creating at Regather, uh, and it starts to give you a, an idea of how we can shape a food chain into a local food system, a localised food system, uh, but also you can see the donut around it, food policy and food partnership, because it's those things that shape that environment, and obviously the food partnership for us is, is Chef Food, uh, and, and all the different kind of partners and partnerships that exist within that food system, because there, there are many of them. But it, it, you know, gra graphically that starts to illustrate it. So, you know, the challenges we face. I just want to highlight a few key challenges. So, land. Can I, sorry, can I just hurry you on there, Gareth? Sorry. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. I'm not. I'm, oh, not keeping an eye on the time. Yeah. So we've got land as being a, a major factor. We need access to land. Um, there's a key issue around labour supply. Um, we need uh, the right training uh, and we need skilled labour in order to make uh, food systems more sustainable. And um, we have to think about the inputs. So the kind of inputs that are needed, particularly with uh, urban agriculture, um, really need to be thought through. So how it is we might consider certain types of, of inputs um, and, and how we achieve those, particularly within urban ecosystems. And you know, what we're working towards, uh, because it's a densely populated urban environment, is a more fully integrated urban agriculture. And so just to close up there, so uh, we've got this model, so we need to plug into urban ecosystems. So that might include sources of heat, uh, water, uh, CO2 being reused, uh, light, uh, in the form of, of electrical energy to extend growing seasons, uh, soil and the role of soil and composting to create soil uh, because we are under threat of, of losing fertile soils and, uh, and the role of data. So re recognizing that data plays a really important part in shaping uh, our food systems and, and, and much more. But um, uh, thanks Lisa for the reminder, uh, uh, back to you. In, okay. in the studio <laughs> brilliant thank you Gareth and, and sorry to rush you there you, you, you know you've got a lot of great knowledge and uh, you know the regather case study you know we can come back to that in the in the questions and discussion hopefully um, right. so that's set that's set the you know the scene for the sort of complexity of the food system so now we're going to sort of dive into the um, uh, zero com what, what can we do to, to reduce the carbon. And uh, for this, for this we've got our next speaker. Uh, Dawn, if you want to start um, uh, showing your screen and I'll, I'll introduce you while you're doing that. So Dawn Ward, um, she's got a background working as a back, an energy consultant, an environmental builder, a wind energy research and engineer, and a tidal energy designer. Uh, I think just finishing up your PhD, I don't know if we can call you Dr. I've, yet. I've finished. I've finished. Oh. Congratulations, all, yeah. All finished, all good. Yeah, graduating June. So. <laughs> well done. Um, and Dawn is passionate about the benefits of following a plant-based diet for zero carbon sustainable food for the planet, our health and animals. And I think, you know, if, if you've seen the news this week with the Biden Climate Summit, there's been a lot of talk about, you know, how we need to change our diets to, to reach our carbon goals. So Dawn, over to you now. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, can everybody see that screen okay? Yeah, yeah that's great. Um, so there will be probably a little bit of a crossover with some of what Gareth has said um, as well, but uh, I'll, uh, I'll try not to give you too many repeats. 
So, um, I mean, I think one of the biggest things we need to realize is just quite how big um, an impact the food chain actually has, which is why I've sort of put this figure up here. 13.7 billion metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent from our, uh, from our food chain part of the agriculture. Um, and 43% of the world's ice and desert free land is used for agriculture. And then there is a further 2.8 billion metric tons that's used for non-food orientated agriculture like biofuels, textile crops, and animals that are used for things like leather and wool. Um, and now this is where we'll definitely cross over with some of the things that Gareth has done. Um, where we, when I'm talking about the sort of like the main contributors, we talk about land use, um, you know, the deforestation, the fact that land that we don't use can actually be uh, sequestered, the carbon can actually be sequestered, which is a good thing. So if we can reduce the land that we're using for agriculture, we have a, a much more increased sort of biodiversity and uh, rewilding that can actually happen. Um, on the farm, we have the negative impacts of uh, methane and the farm machinery and all of the fertilizers. We have um, a lot a lot of fertilizers are creating some massive problems um, with our environment. They're very, very nitrogen rich and they're often washing into our, into our waterways and into our riverways. So the whole way that we actually farm at the moment is not actually a way that's particularly very good for us or for nature. We've got the animal feed side of it, which is a, a, a massive use of agricultural land. So a lot of agricultural land is actually used to grow animal feed. Um, it's, it's in the 80% of what we grow for soya is actually used for animal feed. The same with things like corn, an enormous amount of the corn that we actually grow goes into animal feed. So we're actually feeding ourselves by feeding someone first and then actually eating that person. So we're not getting our calories directly. Um, now processing, I mean, this is very, very brief. It's only giving you, certain, you know, a little bit of an idea of, of the emissions and the energy use that are coming from that. Transportation, both uh, within our country and internationally, is a big factor. Retail, things like refrigeration uses a lot of energy um, and, and the energy use in general in storing those foods um, throughout the seasons as well as... Um, things that are actually going to go off. And then although packaging would naturally come before retail, because uh, we've got such a waste side of it, which uh, as Gareth talked about, um, we've, we've actually got that. And actually something that isn't within my presentation, but did come into my mind while Gareth was talking was also the waste that we create, which we just throw down the toilet. In some, in some counties, I know that in Leicester, they have um, uh, anaerobic and um, digesters that actually turn our body wastes actually into energy which is obviously something that uh, is, is a good thing to be promoting too. So this is uh, just trying to give you a little bit of an idea when we actually break down into what the different actual foods are that we eat on what that actually is in terms of the impact um, on our planet. And we can see here, this is a study that was done that, that sort of became quite famous in Oxford that was nearly 40,000 farms. Um, and we can see that the biggest areas here are not what we're often often have been told recently. That doesn't mean that buying locally isn't good, and that doesn't mean that growing organically isn't fantastic. But actually, our biggest impacts actually come from the land use, the actual farm and the farming practices, and the actual animal feeds that are actually shown in this chart. And we can see that, you know, I mean, obviously this talk is about eating plant-based food anyway, but we can actually see that the plant-based foods that are down the lower end um, are, are producing a lot less negativity in terms of the, the carbon emissions. We're talking between 10 and 50% 50, 50 lower than most animal-based products that we actually have. So that, that graph was actually done on weight, but also there's the, a lot of arguments that are done on, on protein. So I thought I would also show this just so that people could see what the comparison is. You can see that the trends are pretty much the same. You know, the trends of, 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 of our global impact, whether it's based on a weight of a, of a product per kilogram or whether it's based on protein here, they've used 100 grams of protein, are pretty much the same. If we're actually eating a high meat-based diet in comparison to eating a plant-based diet, our impact negatively on our environment and um, on, on the environment of, of all other creatures uh, on this planet is, is immense. 
we're talking uh, that we're, you know, we've got a 61 to 73% reduction that you could actually achieve in your carbon footprint um, compared to a meat, fish, dairy and egg consumer. I mean, I, I think it's a no brainer to me. If, if, you're, if you're a strong environmentalist, this is, this is a no brainer. That's, it's, the, the figures speak for themselves. And then when we look at um, land comparison, we've got a very similar thing, we've had in similar trends. We have actually got some, some changes here in things like, um, uh, uh, um, things like, uh, uh, sorry, like the cheese is much, much higher here than uh, uh, the dairy herd, but still they're much, much higher again than, um, than, than fruit and, and vegetables and plant-based food. And if we actually switch to a more plant-based diet, we can actually use 75% less land. And I know that Lisa spoke a lot at the beginning about you know, biodiversity and rewilding. You know, if we actually had three to every four fields back that we could actually use to actually give back to nature, and actually increase that biodiversity and actually rewild those fields, not only we, the, the carbon that's being shown here is just literally what it is being used, but what we've not got here is also the carbon that would be sequestered in, in that 75% of soil, which would then reduce the atmospheric um, carbon even more. So, oh, oh, I skipped ahead there and I'm not quite sure how to go back on here. Oh, can I go back there? Oh, yes, I can, there you go. <laughs> I've learned something new every day. <laughs> um, so yes, yeah, so um, 3.1 billion hectares less farmland if we switch to an exclusively plant-based diet. And I don't know about everybody else, but I love it when I come across areas where the land has been rewilded, you know, rewilded. And you're seeing, you know, the long grasslands with, uh, you know, so much more insects, so much, uh, so much more growth. I've actually got um, a couple of acres uh, near Aula Bar, which I'm slowly rewilding that I've had for four years. Um, I've got some rescue sheep on it as well. And it's amazing to see the insects increase, the birds increase two curlews were uh, on there last week and I'm really hoping that I'm going to actually be able to encourage them to actually nest there as well. So, uh, you know, it's, it's amazing to actually see what can actually be done. When, when land is even just left alone, when we don't even do anything to it, just actually let it go back to nature. And what that actually means in terms of our environment. So we're talking about 30 gigatons of uh, carbon dioxide that could actually uh, be saved by just actually being sequentered into the soil. So um, we also talked about what sort of things we can actually do, you know, in terms of like local government and also the national government. And I mean, obviously on an individual basis, we could literally just stop eating meat, fish, dairy and eggs. And that would make an uh, amazing difference. The, you know, there is an enormous amount of food out there. Obviously, with anything, what you eat is going to make a difference too. You know, if you're eating a... Uh, uh, you know, a plant-based pizza from your supermarket wrapped in plastic, or you're going home and actually making that yourself, half from crops that you've grown in your own garden or that you've got from your own community garden, then, you know, it's a no-brainer that uh, the second option is going to be much, much better for the environment as well as for your health. Um, but even with eating, this, this, these studies were done using products that were actually, you know, the standard products that people go and buy that are actually processed meals too which shows that we can actually achieve even better um, reductions if we actually were, were, were living more naturally based diets as well. I think uh, um, Gareth talked a lot about uh, education. I can't agree with that more. Um, I think that it's really, really important that uh, um, within schools and within hospitals, we actually provided meals. I think it's really important that we're actually in schools teaching them this. Um, I used to actually be a science teacher and we don't teach very much at all about the food. Um, it's, it's so brief. We really, we really need to be updating, updating that and letting, you know, the young people at the end of the day are the ones that are going to really be making a lot of difference in the future. We need, we need them to actually understand a lot more about where food is coming from. Um, on a, on a local level, I think this made the news last year that uh, the mayor of uh, Lyon in France, and having lived in France for a few years, I can tell you, this, this was amazing news, that um, he'd actually uh, um, put in a, a, a ban that uh, 29,000 children within, within Lyon were no longer going to be given um, meat within the school lunches, that they were going to be going to uh, vegetarian and plant-based uh, 
um, menus, which was amazing. He obviously got an enormous amount of flack for that. Um, and I think also on a government level, you know, there are lots of things that we could be doing, you know, colour coding on, on packages to show uh, the environmental costs that, that the government should be making, um, you know, producers actually do that within their adverts as well. Um, the government's encouraged farmers to, 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 to phase for, away from such an animal intensive farming practices. And a lot of the subsidies that are given at the moment are for those practices, whereas giving um, financial and practical help to enable farmers to actually switch more to a direct human plant production would be a really good step too. Um, and, you know, updating our food pyramid, which is very, very outdated and very, very um, lobbyist led um, would, would be really, really good, I think, because so many places like hospitals actually use that food pyramid as a way of actually deciding what food they're going to actually give them. Um, and I've also think, you know, I know that this isn't really particularly part of what we're going, but I'm going to actually just give you a few here, a few of the benefits, other benefits that you can actually get from having a plant-based diet. I myself class myself as a vegan rather than a plant-based because uh, you know it goes a lot it goes a lot further than just uh, just just eating the plants and of course you get all of those benefits as well you know it's much much better for our health there are lots of other emissions other than carbon that are produced through animal agriculture we obviously reduce that that cruelty that is just inherent in animal farming there is just no way you can't you can't uh, you can't kill an animal in a way that is humane it's it's impossible to actually do something like that in a humane way um, I'm also here just for other people's information that people might want i've included a, a list there of the four main um, articles and journals that i actually got a lot of the figures from for people that would like to actually delve a little bit deeper i've also included my email there for anybody that has any questions for me that might pop up after today and a few suggested documentaries for anyone that's uh, interested in going a bit further so thank you Thank you very much, John. That was that was amazing. Uh, uh, what a shame you're no longer a science teacher. All those kids are missing out on your, you know, well, fantastic presentations. Yeah, but, yeah. I, I would I would really like to go in and actually, uh, you know, do do. I've I've done a lot of uh, different things, so I, you know, I'm planning on maybe getting back into doing some stuff, but maybe not directly as a teacher, but still going into the schools to educate on. Great. Um, well, that was that was a really sort of powerful uh, uh, advocacy there for for a plant based diet or a vegan diet. Um, and and we do have a rewilding event in September. I know the organisers here today, so we may come back to you for, for, for a little uh, case study on that. Um, and thank you for identifying, you know, what local councils and national, what we should be lobbying local councils and national government for as well. I think, you know, with the Environment Bill, uh, there's a huge opportunity there to, you know, to, 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 to shift farming, you know, away at, uh, back towards a sort of more sort of supportive environmental sustainable agriculture um, and just to say that in the write-up i'll put all the you know all the all the additional links and further reading will will be included um, but that's great so so we're now going to move on to our third speaker today um, so uh, our last two speakers are sort of you know local projects you know where people can really get their hands dirty uh, and get down with the soil um, so we've got Jane Woodward uh, she's from Incredible Edible Chesterfield which is a, a, a fantastic project of the uh, Chesterfield Time Bank. Um, incredible Edible, it's a community movement. I'm sure many of you have heard of the original one, uh, encouraging people to grow fruit, vegetables, herbs, and pollinators in public spaces for anyone to pick for free. Uh, you know, it's a wonderful community activity. It gives a fantastic opportunity to come together and share. So Jane, uh, over to you. Thank you for coming. Sorry, I was just unmuting myself. Um, yeah, so just to explain, um, I'm talking to you on behalf of Chesterfield Time Bank, who um, sort of are the front facing aspect in Chesterfield of Incredible Ad Edible. Just to um, explain that I work for North East Derbyshire Citizens Advice. So I do um, sort of benefit and debt advice for people. And obviously some of that includes food poverty. And I also um, project manage the Feeding Britain and, and um, food bank aspect of, of citizens advice's work, which obviously follows through into um, other aspects and what I'm going to be talking about. But Chesterfield Time Bank um, operates within Derbyshire now, so it's not just Chesterfield. Um, Chesterfield Time Bank 
um, like we have members, we have ind individual members and um, group members. So any organisations, businesses or individuals can join. Um, and we've got a Facebook page and we've got um, internet um, website. So anybody can look us up and, and join us. We um, reference check. So um, we do do reference checks. So as part of Chesterfield Time Bank, um, we have got a couple of projects. So time banking is the main aspect of our work, but to encourage time banking, we, we look at getting involved in projects that we think are important or that we think will help with the aims of Chesterfield Time Bank. And Incredible Edible was just something that we identified as we wanted to, to be involved with. Um, and what, what I particularly liked about Incredible Edible was that it was... Um, it was using growing um, as a visible sign of a kind of community. Um, and it also um, promotes the aspect that um, there's power of small actions, which is what Chesterfield Time Bank are all about, is all about really. So what Chesterfield Time Bank, um, what we do as far as Incredible Edible is we've got a few sites around Chesterfield, around the areas that we, um, pre-COVID unfortunately had group gardening sessions in so we used to we, we send out dates for when we're going to get together and do gardening but those sites are ours to manage um, so individuals members can go down um, and garden in them at any point so it's giving them giving people that probably haven't got the space or the area um, to go and um, do some gardening, but obviously of an edible variety. So we, we want to encourage people to be growing food. Um, one, so that they know where food's coming from and the children that are walking by understand where food comes from. Um, and, and also so that, that in terms of people can just go and get the food. The food is for anybody's use. So anybody can just go and pick the food and use it. Obviously, we, we organise it as a membership, as Chesterfield Time Bank members, but obviously we, we'd be happy for anybody to get involved. You know, anybody can go and garden, anybody can um, use the food. It's, so you don't necessarily have to be a member. If um, It's just that we use our volunteers and our members to keep the project going we're looking at expanding it into um further areas and obviously we work with local authorities to get we have to have their permission to work in the public areas um we're obviously trying to encourage businesses and individuals to grow edible food in any space that they can so basically in pots and in um, containers on the front doors on the garden so that as people are passing by they can use that food if they want to or they're visibly seeing how food is grown um, we've got a few um, containers and spaces that 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 we grow edible things in um, and we maintain those um, so that's really we 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 continue we want to expand the con the project we want to continue with it we, we'll be looking at funding um but the more partners we've got the more people and partners we've got that are, will sort of abide, encourage and work on the project it is great that you know that's what would help us to expand sort of expand the 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 theme of incredible edible basically just just out of interest as well we, time bank also uh, as a separate project do um a food sharing um through fair, fair share we we collect food from local supermarkets and then share it between members to reduce food waste so that's that's a separate project that um but that's that's obviously uh, links into the, the 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 themes and the beliefs that Chesterfield Time Bank have got in sort of improving the environment but also improving individual people's lives um, and communities so I don't know whether that's enough information for everybody to understand what we do and how we do it um Lisa gave some of the information I was going to tell you about in in a brief introduction um 
but I'm happy to answer any questions or give anybody information um, if they've got any queries. That's lovely. Thank you, Jane. Um, we'll, we'll save the questions till the end. Um, but maybe if you put in the chat, you know, maybe put your email or Time Bank's email. So, you know, a call there, you know, for, for partners across Derbyshire, basically. Yes. And, and, you know, also local authorities. And, and to me, the, the beauty of the project, you know, as well as, you know, raising awareness, but it's using all those 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 little useless bits of space that are just you know they're sprayed by the council or they're you know they use for some useless sort of you know uh, ornamental plants when they could be used for growing food so and for people like you say that don't have space um and uh, you know as well as a good educational project you know it's fantastic so so all power to you there uh, and as well as the food share project and i should mention as well in chester we also got a, a waste not cafe which is a similar thing, which is takes the waste food from supermarkets and does a sort of monthly meal pre pre COVID as well, of course. Um, so thank you, Jane. So any you know you know put any questions for anybody any of our speakers uh, in the chat. But we'll move on to our final speaker today. Um, so Chris, if you want to start uh, showing your screen, and I'll just introduce. You. So Chris Brooks, um, also from Transition, uh, and he's the currently the chair of Inspire Community Garden. Uh, and this is uh, an organic demonstration garden which follows permaculture principles. Uh, it was set up by Transition Chester in 2015 uh, and it's now a separate charity which grows food, teaches people how to grow food organically and provides therapeutic horticulture. So over to you, Chris, thank you. So we'll start off with my PowerPoint presentation. No, okay. As, so as Lisa said, Oh, I can't move through the slides. Yeah, mine, mine sometimes stick as well, Chris. You've just got to really keep. <laughs> yeah, okay. Right. So we we, felt we were, as Lisa said, we were part of um, Transition initially. We came out of Transition. We had a brainstorming session and all these post-it notes came out of, of that. All the ideas that we wanted to do to show what Transition was about and how it could work. And they all sort of came together as a... Uh, a garden with extensions. So the garden isn't just a uh, where we grow stuff. It's there to learn from and to demonstrate how things can be done and to teach people. So we are luckily found a, a bit of land that uh, used to be an old allotment that is part of fair play and they let us clear it. So when we moved in in the top, so we're going to go around the top right hand corner, um, we, we found somebody with a tractor and he came in and he bashed down four foot high brambles so it looked clear like, like it does at the moment. We then found lots of dips and hollows and we slowly cleared the land. We needed somewhere to, uh, to meet, it's very, it gets cold. Um, we brought in a caravan which we paid £100 for. We pulled out some of the walls inside and we put in there a, um, a log burning stove and we only burnt logs that we managed to get on the land. We, uh, we mounted um, LED lighting and solar panels on that. And that was done as a workshop. We also taught people how to do that for themselves. But it means that we can meet in the dark in the evenings and have um, enough lighting to be able to read by. Or some of the rooms are quite dark during the uh, summer even. You can still see to read packets of seeds. The, uh, we later moved on and put a big ramp onto the and a veranda on, front of, on the front of that so that people in wheelchairs could access the, the caravan. We worked right the way through the winter. The uh, picture of the snow down there, uh, we're actually building the, uh, the, the decking outside the caravan at the time. We used a spare sort of wood from the decking to build an area over an outdoor kitchen. So at the moment, we're only looking at the top half of the garden. And we, we, built a, we did a workshop on how to build a pizza oven, for instance. And then when we were allowed open days, we uh, used to cook pizzas or even a barbecue. We uh, upcycled things, the uh, stainless steel table that we used there for serving and preparing on, that was uh, came from out of Queen's Park when they shut Queen's Park down. So it's all about reuse. The caravan you can see down in the, in the middle picture, and the caravan, the, uh, the greenhouse you can see down in the, the middle picture, that was donated to us, all the sheds were donated to us. So what do we do there? Well, we hold, not only do we, we grow stuff and show people how to grow stuff, 
We also hold workshops. So starting the, the first picture on the on the left, the uh, we had a apple pressing, how to get rid of these surplus apples, how to press them, and that's all done through transition. We had a we we, had, we <coughs> sorry because we don't have water on site, we uh, we can't have a proper toilet, so we have a composting toilet. We also did a workshop on how to build your own composting toilet and how to treat it. We uh, we have family sessions where the well, there's not many kids on that one, but uh, that was pumpkin carving, so we used some of our surplus pumpkins for that. But they all, we also have other sessions for the, the kids. Because we recognise that not everybody can get down and dig, we have raised beds, and we've built a number of raised beds to show how, how best to use those. And again, coming back along the bottom, because we don't have a, a water supply, we have to harvest all our own water. And what we actually have here is a polytunnel that, hot, that has guttering, which is quite unusual. So not only do we collect all the water off the, the caravan, we collect it off the, um, off the polytunnels and the sheds as well. We were once inspected by uh, Britain in Bloom, and at the time um, we were using one of our hose pipes to water the, uh, the, the polytunnel. A hose pipe that said, you haven't got mains water. Now we have a solar pump watering system, so we can move water around between the, the various polytunnels and IBCs using a hose pipe, and the water is just moved using ordinary pumps, 12 volt pumps, running off a solar panel and an old battery. So we really are able to move things around. We can uh, we also set in the middle of setting up an automatic watering system in one of the growing areas, off, which I'll come to in a moment. The pizza oven, as you can see there, nice and hot. That, that will cook you a pizza in about 90 seconds. It's, it's very fast, very tasty. And we'd put on what we can from uh, out the garden, the vegetables out of there. Now, besides inviting people to workshops, we have other groups come down. So a lot of the, uh, the paths, which are made out of chippings, they were all, the chippings were spread by um, groups come down. The Cubs, for instance, love to wheelbarrow chippings around. I have no idea why. They also, um, Dove into a, dived into a big hole and pulled all the stones out of a pond we put in. But they also come down twice a year. So they come down at the beginning of the year. In fact, they'll come down this week. Uh, and they will go away with a, a little seedling, uh, put in uh, some seeds. They're going to grow um, sunflowers this year and a runner bean. So, they can, so instead of having to find canes and things to grow the runner bean up, they can grow the runner bean up the sunflower plant. Show them uh, some different growing techniques. And then they'll come back in September time and they will uh, have a look again how the garden's developed. They'll dig up some potatoes, they'll pull off some runner beans, perhaps pull out some carrots if we've got some, and they will cook them and eat them while they're there. So they, we get the education in there, we get them in young, we show them uh, completely from uh, seed to eating their, their own food production. They really seem to enjoy that for some reason. Right, so this is what happened to the, the land in the end. We, it's got divided up into lots of um, organic beds. So we do a, a standard crop rotation round. Uh, we have two very big polytunnels. Uh, we have um, some wildflower areas. We have a, a pond. Um, the picture there unfortunately shows it full of water. It's, it's a little bit low at the moment, the water, but it is full of tadpoles. So it's done very well. The, the bottom pictures showing the plants Last year, we had 23 varieties of tomato plants were grown for sale. And we grew 30 varieties of potato on the land. So although we're not there to grow mass produced food, we're there to show how the food can be grown. One of the problems we have though, of course, is with the frost we've been having, we can lose a lot of our early tomatoes and peppers and things. And because it's all on staging, you haven't got the warmth from the ground. So we're using, the first picture on there, is a miniature hot box. So instead of the plants standing straight on the, the tables, they're standing trays full of um, either manure or grass cuttings, which provide the warmth and keep the frost off the, the plants. And that seems to be very successful this year, way of um, making the plants last. Other workshops we do, we've obviously did one on how to put the plot pond in. We do ones on um, bumblebees. We've done one on how to chop and store wood, how to uh, forage for food. 
Uh, we mentioned the solar panel one, uh, and then we do, we, we have volunteers come down here just to learn. So we don't use any chemicals. This year, we've not even used any petrol rotavators or anything. It's all hand dug or no dug beds. And we just continue to try and develop it and push it on as we can. But in, uh, in four and a bit years, we've, we've come quite a long way, thanks to the volunteers. And one of the volunteers climbs trees and rescued the, one of the greenhouses from apples dropping on it. So quite a, a useful thing. Okay, I think that's some of what Inspire is about. It's open to anybody who wants to come along and learn or give us a hand. And take away what we grow. Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, yeah, I mean that that just shows, you know, you know, through reuse, recycling, and a bit of sort of a lot of innovation and um, uh, you know permaculture principles, how you can grow food in a very sort of sustainable way and enhance the sort of biodiversity of a plot. And should say that you know the, 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 there are other community gardens in Chesterfield, and there's there's quite a few across Derbyshire. There's quite a network of, of community gardens now. Uh, and I think, you know, we can all learn from each other. So those are all our presentations. Um, please, if you've got any questions, uh, please uh, type them in the chat. Um, I don't see anybody in there, any in there at the moment. So I might have the privilege of asking uh, the first question. Um, so we've, we've heard, you know, it's quite a diverse range of speakers. Um, we heard from Dawn what, what we should do individually, you know, to reduce carbon, you know, we need to, we need to, Eat less meat and dairy and, and, and more plant food. Um, but in terms of collectively, um, and, and Dawn did give some suggestions, do any of the speakers have thoughts about what we should, what is the best thing we should be doing collectively? Um, I'd particularly like to hear from, from uh, uh, Gareth about the Sheffield Food Partnership, how, how that's helped to bring all these different diverse, you know, partners, growing partners, uh, food banks, you know, whatever it is, you know, to, to sort of try and make make the most of what you've got locally and, and uh, you know, uh, yeah, all, the, all the synergies of all the different growing uh, projects. Anybody like to have a go at that? What should we be doing collectively uh, to reduce carbon and to make our food grow more sustainable? Anybody want to go, Gareth? Uh, yeah, okay, thanks, Lisa. Um, I think if we're going to focus on um, a scale that's at a community uh, or, or sort of, you know, neighbourhood level. Um, I'd promote any any kind of cooperative or collective purchasing of food um, that allows households to change their uh, you know, buying, eating, cooking, uh, waste disposal uh, habits. Um, because I think that's, you know, yes, food is one of the most accessible ways into tackling climate change and the climate emergency, but uh, at a, you know, an individual or, or household level on its own, um, the impact of those actions uh, you know, can has it has the potential to be magnified by by collective action, and but but the challenge there is simple things like logistics and convenience and cost, uh, the practicalities of uh, of doing things, and you know the Inspire Gardens a great example where where you know coming together as as, as a group um, and acting collectively. Uh, makes managing a garden easier. So, uh, but I, I think, you know, our, you know, we're all, we're all consumers, you know, we, we spend money on food uh, every day and every week. Uh, uh, some of us are producers maybe as well to supplement that, but yeah, let's not forget, you know, that um, what we do with our money uh, and how we spend our money, particularly on food is the, possibly the most powerful expression of, of uh, you know, our intent to, to change how the food system works. So yeah, food co-ops, collective buying groups, box schemes, bag schemes, I'm sure they exist in, in Chesterfield. I know Riverford serves the Chesterfield area and um, you know maybe there are smaller bag and box schemes as well. And if there aren't, they're incredibly um, straightforward to, to set up 
uh, but obviously requires um, some some organisation. But there's some really great resources out there uh, to uh, to get things going. You know, the food food co-ops on the Sustain website. Some really, it's you know, step by step guide, and uh, you get better value for money. Uh, you're creating community through food and um, you're taking control of you know, where your food's coming from uh, and creating a route to market for local producers, you know, and they might then make a living out of out of growing food. That creates the employment and that creates the opportunities for younger people who, who need to learn what to do uh, uh, to think about that as, as, as a living in the future. You know, that's the that's the whole system changing in front of you. I'm sorry, Gareth, before I go to the speakers, can I just ask you what your, your local councils, what, what kind of support are they giving to the food partnership or how are they involved? Well, hmm. our local authorities have a huge range of statutory responsibilities relating to food, diet and health. And they have limited resources with which to uh, deliver on those statutory responsibilities. Now, local authorities have a role and can take a role in facilitating you know, food partnership activity and food system change, but that isn't part of their statutory responsibility. And I would caution against anybody looking directly and maybe exclusively to their local authority as being the source of uh, change resource etc etc you know they're under huge amounts of pressure uh, and I would strongly advocate uh, anywhere uh, collective action that is more at a kind of community or grassroots household neighborhood level um, because you know that is part of the food system that actually our local authorities don't have a great deal of, of control or influence over is the reality so so I would yeah I would caution against relying uh, on the role of our local authorities. Um, but then equally, I would strongly advocate that there is a specific and maybe discrete role for local authorities where they have statutory responsibilities or they have you know, um, the resources from national government or, or from, you know, as a result of being the local authority through their council tax or you know, funding with through the health or education systems, you know, or business support and so on. You know, it requires a very multi-faceted um, uh, approach, uh, but that's complex, you know, and um, it's, uh, it's difficult. In Sheffield, our local authority has, um, I think, excels in certain areas of delivering its statutory responsibility, but they are also under huge amounts of pressure uh, to deal with health inequalities, poverty, uh, and and real substantial economic challenges, uh, you know that, that that are apparent in Sheffield and are um, are in elsewhere, and so it's really actually um, up to uh, I think a more of a, a kind of citizen led approach to food system change, um, uh, um, uh, that that we can see you, you know a, a real uh, opportunity um, to to do what needs to be done, um, and that's why I'm part of a cooperative. That's why I set up, help set up a, co a cooperative with a group of people, because that is the I think the the most appropriate uh, response. It's a community led response uh, that then can be supported uh, by not just local authorities but other anchor institutions, businesses, uh, national bodies, and so on. Um, but yeah, it's got to be from the bottom up, you know, uh, th these, these things again and again have been proven to be ineffective to be, you know, when they are solely top down initiatives. Um, so we've got to think about actually what we're asking for. Okay, that's very clear. Thanks, Gareth. Yeah, so it's, it's got to come from us, you know, let's not rely on the council. Uh, do, do any of our other speakers want to come in on, you know, collectively, what, what should we be doing? Dawn, did you want to say anything? Um, I think uh, um, I, I sort of slightly disagree in the sense that I do think the government should have more of a responsibility, whether or not it's easy to make them or not. But when we look at things like at the moment, 
that our local councils have been given a big chunk of money to encourage renewable energy and um, you know different different methods of actually reducing carbon in that way shouldn't some of that also be done to actually try to reduce the carbon within our food systems too and you know people like Gareth are the experts that they should be going to 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 learn on how that can actually happen um, you know I, I I think that I agree that you start yourself with yourself as well we've got we've got a lot of power as an individual and as a community um, to actually change you know to change to change things within uh, um, within within our area, but I do think that there needs there needs to actually still be uh, at least some pressure on on the local government, at least for the educational side of it, you know, um, if if nothing else. Um, can I also ask a question? Sure. Well, uh, yeah, Jane, I was just wondering um, within your you know within the um, the sort of the incredible edible sort of side of it. Do you also utilize um, people's gardens? Because I can remember a scheme many years ago, which I can't remember what it was called, where elderly people would maybe give their garden to, to somebody who had the physical strength. Not that I'm saying that all elderly people, because I'm elderly in many ways. Um, you know, I'm just saying that people that didn't have the time or the, or the physical to use the garden themselves had other people come in and they would get an equal share then of the food. Is that something that would be within your scheme? It's an interesting idea. It's not anything that we'd thought about um, or talked about. Obviously, a lot of what happens within Time Bank is from the members. They request things or offer things. But as a as in leading the Incredible Edible, it's something we could think about or look at. Unfortunately, we only started just before lockdown, so we'd only had a few. Um, and obviously, part of what why time bank did it was for the community aspect the meeting up the getting together um so that's where we was focusing pre-covid um but yeah that's really interesting so it's something we can have a look at um but we we definitely just want as many people to start growing food in as many places as they can um you know to even just to and 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 maybe working with inspire would be to get in that education because i think a lot of people are frightened because they don't know how to grow food and they think it's um you need a lot of space or you need expertise you do need some skill but if we can give that give the information to the people um you know to, for them to start it and then i think they'll get a passion for it um and i think it's inspiring that passion that we need we need to do um, but yeah, that's it. it's interesting, Dawn, and it's it's something we can definitely look at and, and talk about. A lot of work to be done. There's a lot of work to be done. You know, we know that. And, and that's where the power of a network comes in, isn't it? Because there's a lot yeah. of, you know, there's like allotments, there's community gardens with surplus produce, there's people with garden space. You know, there's people that have got the space, there's people that have got the time, there's people that need the food, you know, so it's, but it's about linking all those up and, you know, who's going to who's going to organize that and coordinate that you know in, in Sheffield it's Gareth um, you know in Derbyshire how do we how do we link all these things up and how do we coordinate them so that we can get the people that need the fresh healthy food and how can we you know make our, our, our food system more sustainable I think that's that's you know that's the million dollar question isn't it um, got a question from Jules um, do you want to, Jules, would you like to unmute and ask your question? Yeah, I noticed on um, some of the websites and things, particularly universities and stuff, that they talk about food engineering. And I find that distasteful, if you forgive the pun, um, because for me, it implies that we need to process our food a lot. And that's a cool thing to do. And um, I think it's not a cool thing to do. <laughs> the less we process our food, the better for us all, really. And uh, I was listening to a podcast recently where the comment was made, we need to get from farmer and producer to consumer with as little involved in between as possible. And uh, I just wonder if some of this terminology we need to influence it changing to make it sound much more natural and for that to be a more cool thing. <laughs> Could I jump in here? 
Sure. Yeah, please do. Um, yeah, I think that often when they use the term food engineering, they are actually talking about genetically modified food. So, um, you know, it, if anything, it's trying to make it sound a little bit cooler than a word that's already become extremely distasteful for, to most people within Britain. Um, and I think it's one of the real, real worries with Brexit, because, you know, obviously America is, is extremely GMO friendly. Um, and, you know, the European Union hasn't been. Um, we've been allowed to grow GMO food for animal food, um, but we're not allowed to grow it for human, direct human consumption. And I do think that, unfortunately, that is very likely to change. Um, uh, I, I, I went to a, a big conference at the, un at the university that was happening in, um, in Cranfield on... Um, you know, on, on, on agriculture and farming. And, you know, there was, it, it was almost split. There was one half of it that was really pushing towards, you know, agroforestry, food forests, permaculture, you know, growing, growing tree crops in amongst, you know, a, along the lines of, of, of fields. And then the other side of it that was very much talking about, you know, you know, adding fish to tomatoes and all of those things that we all, we all know happens. You know, and I think I think the problem is that there are two sides to GMO. There is the side that's more of a natural side that's always been there as far as we're of our history. You know, the apples that we eat are not wild apples. Wild apples much much smaller and much more bitter. You know, we have we have done natural selection, which is a form of genetically modified in its own way you know we have you know the victorians crossed plums and apples but we're now going a lot further we're now actually going into actually using chemical compounds and using you know things that would never naturally cross in 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 uh, in society and i agree with you totally it's something we want to be really 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 aware of and really make sure that we don't allow them to use these sort of terminologies without being challenged because they haven't got the historical knowledge to know how that's going to affect our biodiversity and our, you know, our, our insect fertility and, and how it affects, you know, different things. So brilliant question. Gareth, did you want to come in there? Did you have your hand up? Yeah, thanks, Lisa. Um, I wouldn't make a, a, a quick leap to um, putting food engineering uh, as a term uh, immediately alongside uh, genetic uh, modification. I think, I, I think that's a bold leap to make, Dawn, but um, there we go. The, I, I think it's a, 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 you know, a more sort of, uh, supermarket-related issue. Um, and I feel like supermarkets are the kind of elephant in the room when it comes to any conversations about food systems, and that I completely agree with with Jules on the, the basic premise of the, the question and, and, and the response. You know, we need to shorten supply chains. We need to minimize processing. Uh, uh, and where processing is needed, it needs to be done in a way that doesn't introduce large quantities of salt, fat and sugar into uh, our diet. Um, the, the nature of the supermarket food system currently is incredibly dependent on processed food, uh, fresh food, uh, and you know, very very perishable goods um, are, are, you know, they're really difficult for the supermarkets to deal with, uh, and they're where most of the waste uh, comes from uh, because they have the shortest shelf life, but you know, they they also have the the largest amount of variation in terms of demand and, and supply, whereas products that have been heavily processed and engineered to use the term um, are there to uh, sit on the shelves for a lot longer uh, and um, uh, as a result of the preserving and processing techniques they do unfortunately have this detrimental impact on our health uh, with, with diet related health problems coming from that, that high fat salt sugar content but in the end um, the, you've got to bring into the argument um, the issue of food supply. And, you, you know, again, I think that that is another elephant in the room in, in, in these sorts of conversations. There are a huge number of people 
um, who need food. Uh, and, and in the UK, you know, we import a significant quantity of that food uh, through incredibly complex and sophisticated supply chains uh, that, are, that are global. And no amount of community food growing um, is going to match the level of supply that is required uh, to meet the demand uh, what we are, you know, facing as a challenge is a an, an issue of moderating a globalised food system in a way that creates some desirable outcomes for, uh, you know, us locally, regionally, and, and nationally. Uh, yeah, and um, you know, the question is, is how can we do that uh, as you know, collectively at a community level, because you know, here we are on a call, uh, we have 23 people here. Yeah, that's 23 households that could change how they eat um, within a relatively short space of time. Within two to three months, you can have 20 households uh, not growing their own food. That's utterly bonkers, uh, given the seasonality, our climate, uh, and, and the pace at which it takes to to set up and grow the means to grow enough food for 20 households, okay? You'd have to plug into uh, a regional and a national whole, wholesale food supply system uh, in order just to serve the needs of those 20 households. So the question is, is how do we cooperate uh, and how do we plug into the economic you know, factors uh, that determine our food choices? And we've got to act as you know, active food citizens uh, and active food consumers and, and change those habits, uh, which inevitably involve a, a, a daily or weekly or monthly visit to multinational, corporate owned, profit motivated supermarket uh, supply chains uh, and outlets. Okay. And, and it's, that's where the majority of the responsibility lies for how it is, you know, food impacts on the global climate and anything in my opinion that doesn't just get to grips with some of those basic factors is aspirational thinking that that won't change how the food system operates on a day-to-day -day basis for each of us as individuals and, and as households so we've got we've got to get real you know these conversations have got to be based on a reality of supply and demand and economy uh, and you know there are opportunities to do that and they are immediately available. They just require a particular approach around food uh, business, basically, uh, community owned food business. Okay, great, great call to action there, Gareth. So uh, yeah, I mean, you're, you're right. We're, we're part of this sort of, you know, horrible global sort of system. And, uh, you know, we're, we're very reliant on cheap food and, uh, you know, processed food as well and, and, and supermarkets. Um, now, I think, uh, sorry, I think Diane had her hand up and Laura's got a hand up and Chris has got a hand up. So, Diane, do you want to come in quickly? Do you want to unmute, Diane? Press the space bar. I'll try and be quick. Um, I'm a foreigner, really, because I moved away from Chesterfield in November and I now live near Chester. So I've got a new um, adventure going on here. I feel really homesick when I see the community garden. <laughs> um, so my little case study is I'm in a retirement flat at Upton by Chester and that means um, what I can do and what I can grow here is constrained but I, I'm trying to beat the system and I'm bringing my fruiting trees, my patio sized fruiting trees here and hiding them among the bushes because there's a certain standard <laughs> but I'm beating it on all sorts of levels but I've managed to get a very small what I call allotment space, not what you call a lot an allotment, but if, in terms of using a rough ground, I think it used to be garage space at one time, and they've now customised it with, of course, you, you've got locked gates to get into it, 
but I've got my growing space are two builders bags. You know the big square builders bags? Two thirds full of beautiful compost, which, which they create and, and bring in. And that's where I'm going to grow my vegetables. So I'm really excited about that. Two builders bags, but the, the community won't see what's going on because this growing space is along a bit of a track. Um, and apart from a sign that says growing spaces, which is what alerted me in the first place, it's not open to the community to see it, but I'm dead chuffed. That's it. That's well, all. well done, Diane, for your little incredible edible Chester there. <laughs> Sounds yeah. like you're making, yeah, very good. I'm very open to visitors and any interchange with um, Chester Polly, for one knows my details so and uh, anyway brilliant okay uh laura's got a question then chris and i also want to bring polly in as well just to tell yeah. people about uh, abundance as well so uh laura um i haven't really got a question i just wanted to um sort of conf i kind of agree with gareth you know however i, I noticed chris was shaking his head but and and what chris has done on that and I, are you a paid Chris, are you, are you paid to do that role? Is it all volunteer? Where is Inspire Garden? Where is this Inspire place? It's very near the centre of Chesterfield. It's our, do you know Chesterfield at all? I work in Havland. Okay, so there used to be some big gas cylinders um, behind Mecca, bingo. Okay, yes. And we're down there. That's quite central, isn't it? Oh, or is it? Anyway, I think about that, but it looked like an enormous space and it looked like a phenomenal opportunity. And I can't believe you've done all that in four years. And I don't know, that, that's just amazing, but it's about finding the space and being offered that opportunity. Yeah. But I'm, I just, I'm just gonna share something that's quite sad, really. My daughter's only 24. Uh, anyway. She's finishing her degree and she doesn't like her. She's living in Norwich and she's, and she's just getting very overwhelmed by all the, the, the problems in the world. And she does a box scheme and, you know, look, there's 23 of us here. We're all passionate about what we're talking, you know, what's going on. And, you know, I think she's picked up on that passion and she's doing a, an international development degree, which she's finishing. And she was in Aldi and she was just overwhelmed by the shit that people putting in their baskets and what they're doing, what they're buying. And, and it's just started crying, you know, just like a mother. And, you know, I'm just a bit emotional at the moment. And it's just, what, what is the answer? There is no answer to the mess that we're in. And it just, I don't, I don't know. I just think that it's all very well, some people having access to growing space, some people having gardens, some people being able to do this and that and the other, and it all feels a little, it's not, it's not an answer to the world's problems, and it's not, it's all very well us sitting here talking about these nice little solutions, but, you know, I think we've got to fight for the world to become a better place which means forcing our governments into action, like proper action, to make changes, big changes. And that might happen at local government level, where we're saying, give us space, make us, you know, I, I don't know, but it, it's bigger, it's bigger than this. And, and it, it worries me that our young people are, you know, they are, Laura, oh. Laura I, I work for Citizens Advice and every day I'm talking to people that have got multitude of issues and it's it gets really difficult sometimes because yeah there is a bigger picture yeah. and we you know the, there's a lot of problems in the world that need solving but small steps and changing individuals ways of looking at things for me is a starting point so you're starting at the bottom and you're working your way up as well as trying to get the cleverer people that I'm not one of them at the top working down and hopefully somewhere we'll meet in the middle. 
Um, but I, I'm a big believer in the small actions uh, and the doing the little things that can help individuals and help us feel better about our lives. Yeah, it does. It so does, hope... feel, does feel overwhelming sometimes. And I think I think Gareth gave a very good, you know, sort of call to action there about you know the power of community and and co-ops and collective action. You know how you know we can feel quite isolated, but I think if we join up, there's so many good initiatives across Derbyshire that I think you know we are we are more powerful than than, than we think sometimes. So anyway, sounds like she's a chip off the block. Oh, there, Laura. <laughs> yeah. Um, could I? Can I just bring in uh, Polly, uh, quickly Polly, because we're nearly at 12.30. Do you want to just say a few words about abundance? You're on mute. Okay. Um, so the lady in Norwich, Norwich is absolutely full of community action. I know this because I know someone who lives there and is involved in a lot. And the trick, I think, is to start nibbling away at the bottom. You can still do, you can still join in with all the, the national action and the other things, but it makes you feel better if you are doing something yourself, which you can actually easily do. And um, my friend Alison and I run Abundance, which is part of um, Transition. Basically, uh, we are growing hugely. Um, we started out just the two of us and we're a bit overwhelmed really. Um, we, we started out just picking fruit, which Lisa ran, didn't you originally, I think? When, were you not the original abundance? No, Bill. Oh, right, okay. Um, but we pick unwanted fruit and now we collect unwanted vegetables and it is amazing that people are so pleased that they can get rid of these gluts and feel useful because we just go in and we pick whatever it is and um, we work with most of the allotment groups in Chesterfield and around and people give us their gluts and we take them to the food bank and particularly to Gussie's who give out um, food parcels which is that they deliver which is a different sort of aspect of the same thing. But the other thing that I've just started doing myself, uh, I'm sorry I'm in the dark, but um, I'm in my conservatory sowing seeds <laughs> um, and I can't stop. Um, but what we're doing is we're doing a thing called grow to give because people don't realize how what a shortage there is of vegetables for people who go to the food banks and have food deliveries because they can't get out and they are isolated. Um, so what I've been doing is badgering everybody I know, and it's been very successful so far, you, just to have a small corner anywhere, grow a few carrots, grow a couple of bean plants. Um, I'm giving away um, squash plants at the moment like mad and squash seeds, and they are, specifically being grown to give away and so the people who feel good are the people who are growing the seeds now um, the people who go and pick and it's a very nice community activity covid you know, we can we shout to each other from opposite sides of people's trees um, and the people who give their gluts from the allotments and it is a feel good thing. There's no downside to it. The only thing I would say about the, the idea of the gardening, we had the idea ages ago, and it really is very, very difficult because we have um, health and safety issues and we have safeguarding issues in both directions. If you're going to an old person's garden, um, you all need to have CRB checks you all need to have health and safety and there's risk assessments and all sorts of things. It's really fair, difficult. To be, fair, to be fair, Polly, obviously Chesterfield Time Bank are fully aware of that side of things. And obviously I work for Citizens Advice. So it's it's not as big an issue as, it's very difficult to get, to get um, 
checks now. You, you can't get a CRB check without having a valid reason. So things are working on a different, a different basis at the minute. Sorry, Polly, can I just interrupt? Because we're, we're over time. Um, yeah, sure, uh, yeah. Chris, is, Chris just wants to make, a, I think, a final quick, quick remark, Chris, if you don't mind. Yeah. We'll it's all right saying we need all these big changes coming in and the supermarkets need to do it and the governments need to do it. But if we start at small and teach people how to grow, then the small growing and their own produce will start chipping away at the need for the supermarkets. And then they'll have to start looking at why it's being done and what people are wanting. So it does fit in with what Gareth's trying to do, but we're coming at it from the other end, small steps. We'll teach them how to do it. We'll even give them some growing space, get them used to it. Not individual growing space, it's done as a community, but we'll, we'll teach people and we'll teach people about it anyway so when people ask well what should i be growing we explain to them so we've got some people that work f um are volunteers who also run other organizations for the voluntary organizations and they get questions about how they should support, um, work with their people and what they can grow and we help them with that kind with questions on that kind of thing what's simple to grow for their environment and as i explained about the cubs i'm not expecting the cubs to have gardens to go home to everything i'm providing them with can be grown in pots on the uh, on the patio with no skills thanks chris that's a very positive note to end it so i think you know the message from today eat less meat and dairy and then collectively <laughs> let's all do you know what we can you know uh, to collectively change change this uh, you know very uh, distorted food system that we've got at the moment so just say a big thank you to gareth dawn jane and chris our speakers today thank you all for for joining us on saturday our next uh, event is uh, Educating for Zero Carbon, 22nd of May, uh, but we'll send out some uh, notification about that. So yes, please give a, a clap uh, to all our fantastic speakers. Thank you very much for all of you joining today. We'll finish the recording now and we'll, we'll send you a, a write-up and a link to the recording later. So enjoy the rest of your weekend. Thank, Thank you. you all. Come down and join us at Inspire. Yeah, and join, join all these <laughs> brilliant projects. And spot any